Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you are most welcome uh, to the TSI monthly lecture series. This is a virtual lecture series that we do every month. And we are pleased to uh, be able to host you. And we are definitely pleased to have you uh, join us this afternoon. The topic for this afternoon lecture is mental health, faith healing, and prayer comes in Africa. Mental health, faith healing, and prayer comes in Africa. We are blessed to have three eminent speakers who are going to address the topic from the mental health perspective, from the Roman Catholic perspective, but also, and also from the Protestant uh, pers perspective. Uh, we are even more blessed to have today as our moderator for this session, uh, Reverend uh, Fia Ban, who is a tutor and chaplain at the Ramsey uh, Trading Center of the Presbyterian Church of Ghana on the mountain in the Kwau area in the Bitifi. Uh, Osofo Fia Ban is also the secretary to the board of the Sunny Institute. Uh, and she's been a, a very wonderful help and a personal friend and encourager. She's actually my personal pastor, even though she doesn't admit that. So we are, we are so blessed to have her to uh, share, to chair this uh, session. And I will hand over to her. She will introduce the speakers. Then the speakers will get on with it. Uh, they are all given some time. And after that, we will have time for your questions and for interaction. Over to you, Madam Moderator. Thank you, Prof, for the introduction. We are equally grateful for the Institute, for the opportunity given to be part of this month's special virtual lecture. Our prayer is that we will have a very insightful lecture this afternoon and a well-inspired one, of course. You are all welcome to, to this afternoon lecture, our noble participants on board and our able speakers. May I introduce to you briefly the speakers for this afternoon lecture. As mentioned earlier, we have three speakers for which each speaker will be given 20 good minutes to present unto us on the given topic, after which we will give opportunity to participants to contribute by sharing their questions and comments through the chat. And so we encourage all participants that as the presentation goes on, you can equally go to the chat column on your page and type or write your question and they will be attended to at the appropriate time in the program. The lecture or the speakers for this afternoon, the first to be presented to you this afternoon is Dr. Joanna Larry Afutu. Dr. Joanna Larry Afutu is a licensed clinical psychologist with a background in human resource development. Dr. Laria Futu is currently the National Secretary of the Ghana Psychological Association. She has been very resourceful in GPA's volunteering efforts at providing psychosocial support to groups and individuals during this COVID-19 pandemic and other emergent and crisis situations in the country. Participant on the line, Dr. Laria Futu has over 30 years full-time clinical practice experience with the Ghana Armed Forces and has part-time clinical and human development experience within some key sectors in Ghana. She is currently a lecturer in the University of Ghana and consult for national and multinational organizations. She is also an associate trainee at the Ghana Police Academy and the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center. 
may I humbly introduce to you and present to you Dr. Joanna Larry Afutu. If doctor is on the line, can we have yes. a wave? Thank you very much, Reverend. Good. You are welcome. You are welcome. Dearly friends, may I introduce to you our second speaker. He is in the person of Apostle Professor Opoku Onyina. Apostle Professor Opoku Onyina is an associate professor of Pentecostalism and African Christianity. He is the immediate past chairman of the Church of Pentecost and also a former president of the Ghana Pentecostal and Charismatic Council. Professor Opoku Onyina publications include the book Pentecostal Exorcism, Witchcraft and Demonology in Ghana, which was published in 2012. Apostle Professor, may we see you before you speak to us. By way, thank you very God. much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Welcome, Papa. The next to be introduced to you this afternoon as one of our speakers is Reverend Father Chrysanthus Kubele. Reverend Father Kubele is currently the War Diocesan Chaplain for the Catholic Charismatic Renewal. He is also a lecturer and the acting registrar at the Catholic Pastoral and Social Institute, whilst in charge of guidance and counseling at the Catholic Education Unit, or in the Upper West region of Ghana. Father studied at the St. Victor's Major Seminary for his Bachelor's of Art in the Study of Religions with Philosophy and Bachelor of Sacred Theology. He has also obtained a master's in educational administration and management, and now doing a PhD in social administration. Father, please, if you're on the line, can we receive a hi from you? Hi. Thank you, participants, for joining. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Without much I do, we go straight to our presentations. The one to give the first presentation is Dr. Joanna Larry Afutu. Please, you have 20 minutes to present to us on mental health and the superstitions and stigma around it. Doctor, you are welcome. Thank you very much, Reverend Defia. I'm particularly grateful for the introduction and then also for the invitation uh, to join this um, conversation. I do not take this opportunity for granted at all. I thank the Institute for um, giving me such opportunity. So I will start with um, a discussion on mental illness and the superstitions and stigma surrounding it. To do this, I hope to give a brief introduction to the topic and then I'll talk about the superstitions about mental illness and the treatment options that result from these superstitions. Then I will talk about stigma and related issues. Then I want us to, if there is time, sort of demystify mental health and look at the way forward in terms of what we should do um, with um, the treatment, the seeking for treatment, um, that result from uh, the superstitions or the discussions that we have. So as a way of introduction, I will say that um, conceptualizing mental health has evolved over the years. We have attributed several causes to mental health and that also informs how we go about treatment options. Um, if we look at the prehistoric cultures, the, they basically held supernatural uh, beliefs about the causes of mental illness. They believed that mental illness is as a result of the work of evil spirits, demons, uh, gods, or even witches who took possession of um, individuals. And so if you are mentally ill, we see it as an external source from um, supernatural um, powers. So 
this form of explanation um, was believed was given because um, demonic possession was believed to have occurred when people involved engaged in behaviors that were contrary to um, the religious teachings of the time. And so largely treatment was focused on trephination, that is drilling holes in the um, skull of the individual to allow this evil spirit to evaporate or to go away from the, the person. Exorcism, prayer, fasting, and other religious um, rituals that was believed to help rid the individual of um, these evil spirits. Going forward, Hippocrates introduced the physiological concept of mental illness. He attributed mental illness to imbalances in bodily fluids, which um, basically for bodily fluids, which he identified in the body. And he believed that uh, because the in imbalances in bodily fluids in the human being cause mental illness, we should look at it from a, a physiological perspective. And so we should, um, in treatment, look at uh, physiological options for treatment. So this idea, um, Hippocrates came about, gradually brought to bear the need for us to treat people with mental illness more humanely. So then um, the moral um, concept of treating people with mental illness came in force. And then the introduction of the asylums began. And people were placed in asylums so that they will be given some level of um, treatment, physical, physiological treatment to be able to get well. Subsequently, the conceptualization and treatment of mental illness has evolved gradually. And currently, we look at the biological, psychological, and social factors that influence mental illness. And then we also look at same in treatment options globally. In Africa, looks like um, the evolution is rather slow um, because we still um, ground uh, conceptualization in cultural and spiritual beliefs to a large extent, or um, let me say to some extent, we still um, look at that. We have not fully come to terms with the biopsychosocial um, explanation to mental health and then um, the, with the treatment options as well. So I'll look at some of the superstitions. I started in Asia reviewing some researches that have been done in Asia. And I had very interesting um, attributions to mental illness. Um, they believe largely that mental illness is caused by loss of semen or vaginal secretions, uh, less sexual desires, um, excessive masturbation. They also looked at it as a punishment for persons from God or from the supreme being. They also looked at it as um, resulting from polluted air. When you breathe in a lot of polluted air, you are um, likely to have mental illness. Interestingly, um, I realized that they also believe that if you are sad or unhappy, you are likely to have mental illness, which is also grounded in a biopsychosocial uh, model that is currently in use. Another interesting finding was that even though these superstitions were rife in Asia, they also believe, some people believe that mental illness is a medical condition. And so um, people resorted to um, the, the psychiatric facilities for mental um, health treatment. Largely, you realize that um, several healing temples for rituals to cure people with mental illness were also available for use in this area. In Africa, studies suggest that we are not rigid in um, looking at the causes of mental illness. We look at multiple and fluid explanations. We are flexible in our, in our explanations. 
and we don't attribute mental illness to only one cause. Most Africans look at the illness as an external attack on the, on the individual. So for instance, we, we believe that from the researches that I reviewed, believe that um, when people have bewitched or under a spell, those uh, individuals could have mental illness. People could also um, be invaded or be possessed by evil spirits. That also gave an indication that um, once somebody um, goes through that the person may have mental illness. Some also believe that, well, um, when you, you do wrong, people in society can put a curse, place a curse on you. And that could also result in mental illness. There, there was um, this particular one, um, attribution to the gods, the ancestors, to God Almighty, the ancestors and, and the gods. That ties in um, with the next one, the sexual deviations and other um, ill in society. They believe that people believe that to a large extent that when people indulge in um, activities or behaviors that God hates or the ancestors prohibit or the gods of um, their land prohibit, they will punish that individual or even punish the whole family or the whole town for um, such acts. And so they looked at people with mental illness as um, receiving punishment from um, these beings or deities. Sexual deviations, they looked at it as an abomination for the God, for God Almighty, for the ancestors and the gods. So they were looking at incest, bestiality, masturbation and other um, sexual deviations. And they realized that once you indulge in any sexual de deviations, the gods will not spare you. If it takes even a year or um, no matter how long it takes, the gods will surely punish you with mental illness. They also, um, we also realize that in Africa, we attribute mental illness as um, resulting from envy. It could be envy from neighbors who feel you are doing better than they are. Or it could be from um, family members who feel that you are doing better than they are, or a particular family line is doing better than um, other ones. And so they attributed, these are some of the superstitions that I got. Interestingly, in my review, I also realized that um, they don't base attribute mental illness to only these superstitions, but they also have the sense that drug and alcohol abuse could result in a mental illness. We also, they also looked at it from the uh, point that it could be attributed to some physiological processes. So for instance, if somebody hits the head or has a head injury, um, that person is likely to have um, some mental illness. Some also believe that when there is breakdown in the social systems, we, we are, people are likely to get mental illness. And that again brings me to the biopsychosocial model that I, I spoke about earlier. So even though these superstitions are rife in Africa as well, and, and for that matter in Ghana as well, you realize that we still, we are not doing badly. The, the graduation is coming. We are realizing that biologically, certain things could go wrong to um, give um, rise to mental illness. We also realize that physio um, sorry, um, socially and psychologically, there are certain things that could make people prone to mental illness. So looking at the um, options of treatment under the superstitions and the conditions that, that I've discussed, you realize that it's logical for people to seek cure based on the beliefs that they have towards the causes of their illness. 
And so it's logical to look for supernatural cure if you believe that mental illness is perceived, is, is caused by supernatural um, factors. And so um, Abi 2019 and then Hobi and Swartz also in 2019 also believe that people with mental illness and their families usually resort to traditional or faith healers or priests of churches or shrines for several rituals and um, basically to call upon God, their ancestors and the gods for intervention for whatever they have done wrong. In these rituals, they present um, pacification, sort of pacification to God, the ancestors and the gods um, to pacify them for what they have done wrong and to seek um, their mercy for healing. I think that um, Professor Onina will put more light on what happens in these um, places. We also realize that even though people largely believe that there are medical, underlying medical causes for mental illness, some of them seek medical care as additional treatment options for the faith-based or supernatural cure for mental illness. So looking at some of the stigma and then related issues of mental illness, um, usually in our society, in the African society, most of us do not recognize mental illness for what they are. We look at the individual and look at the perception surrounding a mental illness and attribute them to the individual. So more or less, we basically judge people with mental illness for doing evil in society. So usually we see them as victims of um, probably witchcraft, um, evil spirits, and other ills in society. We don't look at them as, as people who are ill, as we would for uh, people with diabetes, people with um, um, muscle pains and other medical illness. And so based on um, the misconceptions that they have about the individuals with mental illness, they view and treat them negatively. Sometimes even family members who have to understand the individuals also treat them and view them negatively. Sometimes they, they tag them with names that are derogatory. Sometimes they even call them by their symptoms and that could be very discomforting. Um, buried in mind that these people may be suffering from a genuine mental, a, a genuine medical condition or biomedical condition. So the, they may be discriminated upon. Um, some of the discriminations may be in the form of being shunned by um, people who are close, even family members or neighbors or the entire society. They shun these people because they feel that once I go closer to this person or once I relate with this person, I will also attract the fury of God or the ancestors and the gods for relating with them. We believe that by relating with these people, we, we, we are condoning with the wrongs, perceived wrongs that they've done. And so um, the gods or the ancestors may be angry with us as well. And we may also suffer the same ills that they are suffering. Basically, sometimes the individual is ostracized. Sometimes the family from where the individual come from are ostracized from societies, from the society. The family may not be allowed, people may not allow other family members to marry from that particular family. And like I mentioned initially, sometimes they are judged because they, be, they, are, they believe that it is believed that these people have done wrong in society. And so they are not given access to common social amenities in societies. Sometimes there are excesses, even when they are seeking treatment. And so they may be chained, chained for being aggressive or violent. They may be given concoctions that may be detrimental to their health in general. And sometimes they are beaten. Sometimes they are made to fast, even though um, naturally they may need some 
um, they may need to boost their immune system and take their medications for um, a good prognosis. Having spoken about this, um, I want us to look at what mental illness is and to demystify in our minds uh, what the, these superstitions are. So there is no mental illness or there's no mental health without health. There's, there's no health without mental health. So if we are looking at health as defined by the World Health Organization as a complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not the absence of disease or infirmity, we are also concerned about the mental health of individuals in society. So World Health Organization um, mentioned defined mental health as a state of well-being in which the individual realizes his or her own abilities or potential can cope with normal stresses of life. Are we able to cope with the normal stresses of life? Are we able to work productively and fruitfully throughout our lives or up till now? And are we making good contributions to society or to our community? You may realize that at a point in your life, once in a while, once in your lifetime, you may lack in some of these qualities. And does that mean that you, you must be shunned? Does that mean that um, you, you must be relegated to the background? So if we are looking at mental illness in this um, scope, we are looking at conditions that is affecting our thought processes, our perceptions, our behavior, our relationship with others. So if you are not relating very well with other people, it could even mean that you have mental health issues. And would that, does that mean that you, you, you need to um, be treated in the manner that I've described uh, previously? If you look at these uh, conditions, uh, conditions that are affecting our thoughts, our perceptions and all that, they come in different com combinations. So mental illness may come in with different symptoms, even for people who are suffering from the same condition they may have different combinations of symptoms and the intensity may be different. And so if somebody, we are viewing those who have intense symptoms as outcasts, what, are, what, 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 what if those of us with less severity of symptoms also get there? And so you realize that no one is left out. Mental illness is a concern for everybody in society. And for us to diagnose you with mental illness, these symptoms that I've mentioned, or these um, distresses sh sh should have Im impeded on the person's um, proper personal functioning and then um, the functioning of significant others. So if you are not um, functioning well in your thought processes, in your perceptions, in your emotions, and it is not causing distress to you, it's not causing so much distress or to other people around you, then we want to look at it again. It becomes problematic when people in their distress are having personal difficulty in functioning in their day-to-day -day activities. And also their, their level of distress affects people who are around them, people they may be working closely with or people they may be living with. Mental illness, may be one of, so you may have, for instance, depression for um, once in your lifetime, it, it never comes again. It could be intermittent or it could be long standing or a chronic condition. And just like medical conditions, you realize that mental illness presents in varied form, forms, so, or varied conditions. So we may have depression or mood disorders. We may have psychotic disorders and other kind of disorder. So just as we have diabetes, we have high blood pressure, we have muscular pain and all that. If you are looking at mental illness, it comes in varied forms or varied conditions. So what is the way forward for us? Um, in ending, I would say that traditional or faith-based healing processes for mental illness have existed in many cultures for centuries. And so resorting to such media for treatment is ingrained culturally. 
So are we going to stop them from operating? Would we say that nobody should, should, should tap into um, these processes for healing? I would say that no. Uh, since it's ingrained, people would find their way to seek such care anyway. So I would go for us regulating the operations of um, some of these faith-based or traditional um, centers for healing. Yes, some are doing very well in terms of um, even referring to the psychiatric hospitals and um, giving extra support for people with mental illness. Some too go overboard. There are excesses in some of the centers. And for me, um, I want to look at um, the excesses and to address it appropriately. I believe that there is a need for um, collaboration between um, these um, faith-based based healing centers and then the biomedical health systems. We should reach a point where we could both refer based on the need of the individual. So we can assess um, what is working well in the sentences, in the centers or in the processes that um, for treatment. We could also look at whether there is the need to improve any of the processes in there. And then we should ask ourselves whether there are opportunities for training in these avenues. And I believe that the conversation will continue. Um, if the conversation continues in this direction, we are likely to have um, a better um, treatment plan for people with mental illness. Because it, it, is, it may be me today, tomorrow, it may be you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, doctor, for such a presentation. We have enjoyed it so much. Indeed, mental illness is a concern for everyone. Yes, uh, we want to thank Doc for um, her presentation. It has given us a very good background. So I'm continuing with biblical teachings on, or well, it's supposed to be faith-based, but as a Pentecostal, uh, we prefer divine healing to faith healing. <laughs> so, um, coming from Pentecostal background, I'll use divine healing and what happens as, at the prayer comes. Yeah. So, biblical teachings on divine healing and what happens at the prayer comes. Now, if you come to the Bible, you realize that God heals, Jehovah Rapha. Uh, and that's why we had that term, the Lord who heals. And I think when the people of Israel left Egypt and came to the wilderness as they continued to Canaan, they were somehow afraid of the diseases and the plagues that took place in Egypt. So the Lord had to reassure them that if they obey him, then he was not going to put any of the sicknesses that fell upon the Egyptians on them for he is the Lord who heals all their diseases. So God gives them the basic understanding that I heal as the laws, the deities of the old thought that they could heal, I am actually the one who heals. And then if you continue to Exodus 23, that one is in Exodus chapter 15. If you continue to Exodus chapter 23, and that is another uh, challenging uh, passage which I would like us to read. The first one, I've told you what is there. So the second one, Exodus 23, 24 to 26. I read from the English Standard Version. You shall not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do as they do, but you shall utterly overthrow them and break their pillars in pieces. You shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and water and would take sickness away from among you. So here, if they obey the Lord and destroy all the gods, then God was going to take sickness away from them. Verse 26, none shall miscarriage or be barren in your land. I will fulfill the number of your days. This is a very challenging passage because God is saying that um, he would not allow sickness to befall you. And again, there's no going to be anyone who is barren 
and is going to give you a long life. But all dependent upon one thing, obedience. If you will obey the Lord. If you have faith in Yahweh, the Lord your God, and um, obey him, then these things will not fall on you. So from the Old Testament concept, the people knew that once you obey the Lord, then calamity was not going to befall you. Consequently, if you go to the Bible, you realize that in the Old Testament, for instance, we have people like Sarah, uh, Samson's mother, uh, Hannah, who were healed of barrenness. But the interesting thing is that they were barren before they were healed. So God proved his power to them, but all of them also are associated with the redemptive plan of God concerning the people of God at that time and the coming of the Messiah. And also we have heal, the healing of Naaman, who was leprous in the Old Testament. Yes, yeah, so the healings in the Old Testament are very uh, um, minor. They are not many. They are not many. However, God proved to them that indeed he is the Lord who heals. Now, if you come to the New Testament, remember we are just doing, doing a summary of it. So if you come to the New Testament, the Old Testament, they eventually failed God. Um, the people of Israel as a country uh, failed God. So the prophets prophesy of the Messiah. And if you read the Old Testament, extraordinary signs were going to follow the Messiah. Extraordinary miracles. So when Jesus came, we realized that he announced his presence, his ministry, with signs and wonders. He was going to set people liberty. They were going to experience God's jubilee. So we see here the freedom that the Old Testament prophets were talking about. And if you read the gospel, you realize that Matthew, for instance, placed healing and teachings alongside to show that both were evidence of the ministry of the Messiah. And truly to what they announced or what Jesus Christ announced, we saw healing taking place in his ministry. And the healings also were for specific purposes. For instance, the casting out of demons um, was a sign of the inauguration of the kingdom of God, that the Messiah has arrived. Even demons recognize him, they are afraid of him, and therefore he was destroying all the powers of the evil one. And then if you continue, sometimes you cast out evil spirit or heal to give the people around the opportunity to believe in him as the Messiah. Because it was believed that extraordinary signs were going to follow the Messiah. And I remember that um, the blind man who was healed of his blindness. And when the people were questioning him, and they did not believe in the Messiah, he asked a question, do you think that if the Messiah comes, he will do more than this? You know, if the Messiah comes, when someone told them this, it was very powerful, it was the Messiah. If this man is not the Messiah, if the Messiah comes, will he do more than this? That was very, very powerful. So Jesus' healing were towards specific issues, giving the people opportunity to believe in him, Sometimes he was bringing the marginalized people home. For instance, if you look at the man who was insane, uh, the, 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 the demoniac uh, at Gad uh, Gadari, you see that this man had gone outside society, but Jesus brought this person back home. Now, Jesus passed on his power to the apostles, and we see that occasionally, the apostles were able to exercise their power to get many people also healed. And now, if you pick the healings from the Old Testament, that of Jesus, and some of the apostles like Peter and John healing the cripple, uh, Paul also healing the cripple, but bringing somebody back in and casting out uh, a woman ha who had the spirit of Midian. You, you, we can take some lessons from them. And so here, I want us now to draw some vital lessons from the Old Testament, uh, uh, the ministry of Jesus, and also the apostles. Now, you realize that great faith in Jesus' ministry, one of the things that came out is that great faith 
often leads to healing. You know, if you take the woman who visited uh, him, and Jesus told that uh, Canaanite woman that, no, healing is for the children. You are not part of it. But the woman said, yes, even uh, if even the crumbles fall down, dogs uh, actually uh, eat them. And Jesus described her as someone who had great faith. So that woman, because of the faith that she had, the daughter was healed. We have similar uh, passages in the Bible that if even you have little faith, uh, like a master seed, you can speak to the mountains and it will remove. So the Bible gives a rough picture that if you have faith, that faith can lead to healing. And all the same, you realize that when Jesus cast out demon or healed, uh, he did not allow the people to give publicity. So that one too was very prominent in the Bible. But within the Bible too, we see that divine healing does not always happen. And in fact, if you go to the Old Testament, that great man like Isaac, for instance, became blind. He was a man of God. Through his blindness, he was deceived. Yet God did not heal him of that blindness. We have somebody like Elisha, one of the most powerful persons who have lived uh, in the Bible, Elisha. But the Bible specifically said that he fell ill and died. So it was illness that killed Elisha. But he was very powerful. Uh, Paul, one of Paul's associates was Trophimus. He was very powerful. Uh, Paul was a very gifted person. Trophimus fell sick, yet Paul left him and continued with the evangelical work and the apostolic work that he was doing. And then Paul himself had an infirmity. Many people have not been able to tell us what specific infirmity that he had. But some of us believe that it was illness, possibly of the eye. He said he prayed to God three times, but he was not healed. So the lesson is that healing is the sovereign act of God. Healing is the sovereign act of God. In, not, in, in other words, you can still have faith. You can pray for people. You may be gifted. Yet it is God himself who heals. And therefore, if you come to the Bible, the simple method that the apostles, Jesus was speaking from his own authority. But if you come to that of the apostles, they were using the name of Jesus to heal. The simple name of Jesus. They were not using any rituals and other things, but simply, occasionally, Paul had to use the apron to go and heal. But you realize that they wanted people to put their mind on Jesus and his word, so they were simply using the name of Jesus. In other words, when you are doing healing, you have to be very careful about the methods that you use. Now, we see that <clears throat> we have had a summary of healings in the Bible. Now, if you come to Africa, we have African religious beliefs on healing. When somebody is sick, we expect that when you are ministered herbs or any sort of medication, you should be healed. If the person is not healed, then the person or the family members would have to visit a shrine or a powerful man or woman of God, a traditional priest or priestess uh, for what I call divinity consultation, uh, a visa. They would have to consult the oracles and find out the cause of your disease. So the question is that, why is it that you are not healed and others are healed? And when they found out, usually at the shrine, they would try to give you the cause of the, the sickness. And unfortunately, the cause may fall on an innocent person who may be a woman, a lady, a young girl, a uh, 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 a house assistant or somebody of that nature. And those people who are often accused are those people who, are, uh, who have mental health because of their condition. They are often accused of being witches who bewitch others and, and, and disturb them because of their mental illnesses. And sometimes it comes from the shrine, other times too, it comes from uh, um, uh, unfortunately pastors, Pentecostal, uh, pastors and charismatic pastors. Some of these people will come out with some diagnosis and, and think that somebody who is mentally challenged is, is a witch because the person does not sometimes speak reasonably. And because the person cannot speak reasonably, they associate what is happening 
to uh, uh, witchcraft. And often they are accused of that. But there was this woman who did an ethnopsychiatric study in Ghana, uh, Margaret Joyce Field. Uh, on, on, and then he tried to gather those people who were insane and accused of witchcraft, over 2,000 of them, and realized that many people who are accused of witchcraft are those who have mental uh, challenges. But unfortunately, because of their conditions, we accuse them of witchcraft. And the worst thing is that when they come to churches and they pray for them uh, because of their conditions, some of them would have to keep on shouting. Uh, some of them would, would lament. They would do all sort of people attacking others. And when it comes to, they think that that is the result of demons or witch spirit that is operating in people. And unfortunately, some of them are chained. Uh, they are really chained. And, and somebody wrote a letter to us some time ago. This one is, was in the 90s when he visited the prayer center and some people had been chained and had, were being forced to fast. Being forced to fast and forced to confess. And the person said, what had these people done to receive such punishment? The letter was very, very pathetic. And unfortunately, when you begin to deal with it, they will say that you do not believe in spiritual things. And because you have studied sometimes theology or you are a scholar from any other field, because of that, you do not believe in spiritual things. And they accuse you, if you are not careful, that becomes a hindrance for you to deal with the situation. So that is the predicament of them. And some of them, sometimes some of them are treated very, very badly. And I would like us to uh, watch this, this video if it is able to come out for us. Somebody, I hope you hear it, using a chair, and this is in a church, a prayer center church, using a church to exercise someone who is mentally ill, they thought the person was a witch. That is what you are seeing. Very, very serious. And this is in a church center in Ghana, and not outside Ghana. This is what the person is using to exercise a so-called witch. Look at the cry, the wailing, and people are watching and supporting the so-called pastor. Eventually, he's going to kill the person. The person is going to be taken. Uh, uh. um, that is what you saw. What can we do as a people? What can the government do? Does democracy mean abuse? People say because we are in a democratic government, uh, we have to allow people to practice their faith. And is this how faith is being practiced? When women are being stamped upon, pregnant women, and when people are being forced to carry blocks, cement, and other things, in the name of God, in the name of exorcism, are, are we right? So what should the law enforcement agencies do? Uh, I think some of them would have to visit these places. So can't we redeem our people from this suffering, the, 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 the violence that they are going through, the, the suffering that they are going through? Um, how can we deal with those people who are practicing it in the name of God, in the name of uh, Christianity or in the name of um, uh, Islam? Uh, if you enter into proper Christianity, this is not what is done. This is not what is done in proper Islam. And even in traditional religion too, this is not what is done. So how can the law enforcement do this? I think we need collaborative work, ministers, law enforcing agents, uh, uh, agencies, and um, the government, and um, all, all stakeholders should come together for us to fight this menace in our society. So I think if you come to the Bible, indeed God heals, uh, uh, the Lord cast out evil spirit. Men of God can do that through the power of God. But we have African beliefs that, uh, and practices that conceive that once you are given medication and you are not healed, whether mentally uh, afflicted illness or any other thing, then there should be something behind. And you need a powerful man of God, either a traditional priest, a priestess, or a Pentecostal, or charismatic, or a prophet to cast out evil. In the cause of this exorcism, people suffer. All of us need to come together 
and fight these millions. Thank you very much. And may the Lord bless the efforts that we are making. Amen. Over to you, RMC. Amen. Amen. God bless you, Prof. Indeed, healing is the sovereign act of God. And we are all called to partake in the ministry of bring them back home. Thank you, Prof. May I present to you our third speaker. But before I do so, I want to encourage you. You can send your questions to the chat. They will be attended to at the appropriate time. Let the questions keep coming. Our third speaker, Father Crescentus Kubeli, please may you speak to us. Okay, thank you. I want to first thank uh, my Lord Bishop Richard Bawuo Kumiya, and then the Sanai Institute for this invitation to share in this most important topic, mental health, faith healing, and prayer camps in Africa. And I want to start this way by first giving some general points on mental health. Then I'll look at um, the sacraments because I've been asked to speak on Catholic sacraments on anointing and the practice of exorcism. So we'll look at the sacraments, the importance of the sacraments, exorcism. Then we'll look at some levels of demonic attacks and then the ways that we can also open up ourselves to some mental problems. Then I conclude. So generally, it has been said that about 25% of persons at one point or the other in their lives suffer mental or behavioral disorders. Mental health is relevant today in the face of the fast and busy lifestyle, which comes with a lot of stress and tension. All of us are going through a lot of problems, challenges, worries, assignments, and obligations. And if you cannot process all this well in your mind, you may end up with some mental problems. Unlike physical sickness, where patients easily go to see a doctor for treatment, it is not so with mental health due to the stigma attached to it and the problems faced by people going through it. Prof just showed us a video of how others were trying to exercise somebody. It's very pathetic. Then we can not also deny the fact that there are false healers, fake healers, who are in the system just to extort people. They know they cannot cure you, but they tell you, come, pay so much, I will pray for you. And unfortunately, they enrich themselves at the detriment of others. Stress, anxiety, depression, and the like are caused by negative emotions which reside inside the human mind. And these negative emotions, fortunately, can be dealt with by meditation, which the modern man has little time for. But it's important if every day in the morning or somewhere in the course of the day to sit down quietly and then to be in touch with your body, your soul, your God. It's a lot of healing. Prayer, sacred music, reading, sacred books, or retreating to holy places, or the reading of other spiritual books. All these things can help us handle our mental problems and stress. The real goal and power of spirituality is lost to the modern man today, where any money is the sole goal of every service we provide. So I cannot do anything, I cannot give any service and just feel fulfilled that I've done something good. If we cannot enjoy such services, then we are losing a lot and we cannot handle some mental crisis because in the end, money is not everything. There are many people who have money, but they are not happy. 
So sense of fulfillment and happiness in life is very important. True proper implementation of faith healing, a person can develop positive attitude towards life. And when things are looking hopeless, such a person has something to hold on. Though faith alone cannot heal severe psychotic cases which need medication, it can provide great re relief from stress, anxiety, depression, and fear of the unknown. So my second major thing to look at is the sacraments. So let me, for those who are not Catholics, to explain. Well, when we say sacraments, what do we mean? Sacraments are religious ceremonies or rituals that impact divine grace on us. So they are acts, they are signs, they are symbols externally performed and inwardly restore grace to the recipient. This is the work of God. So they are visible signs of inward grace. The sacraments are instituted by Christ. And in the Catholic Church, we have seven sacraments. And these are the seven sacraments. Baptism, confirmation, the Holy Eucharist, matrimony or marriage, reconciliation, confession of your sins, holy orders, ordaining people to become priests, and then anointing of the sick, taking care of the sick. We have special oils. When somebody is sick, we go to pray for the person and anoint. So these are sacraments. And through this, we are able to help our people. So they are efficacious signs of grace instituted by Christ and handed over to the church. So the next item is anointing of the sick, which speaks to the topic under discussion, healing. So anointing of the sick. So this sacrament offers comfort of God's grace to the sick. It provides both spiritual and physical healing according to God's will. So it enables the patient to join his or her suffering to that of Christ and prepares people to die peacefully. So uh, our savior came to save us and we are now in the Easter period. We are recalling why he had to suffer. He suffered for our salvation. So when we are sick, when we are also going through difficulties, through this sacrament, we know that other holy men and women of God, there are many people in the world also going through pain. And when you add yours to that of Christ, then you are able to accept what you are going through. It gives you some relief because you know that you are with your savior and he is also with you. So it also gives us the opportunity to be able to open up to God and to look for support. I have experienced people who were very violent on their deathbed and then as a priest, I'm called to go and pray for such a person. And then you go, you see the person struggling, kicking the, the legs and hands, and they are struggling to hold the person tight to the bed. But after the sacrament, the person remains very calm, and then he or she may die peacefully. Though the person has died, has not received healing, but the process of dying alone is healing and comforting to the person and then the relatives at the sick bed. So we believe that this sacrament is very important to whoever asks for it. This is done by using the oil of the sick. So depending on the condition of the patient, the sacrament of anointing has three parts. In the Catholic church, so you go first, if the person can talk, the person is conscious and can speak. Then you ask, do you want to confess your sins? And then if the person says yes, as the book of James tells us, is any one of you there who is sick? If you call the elders of the church and they come to anoint him or her and pray for him or her for healing. So if the person says, yes, I need a sacrament, the person does confession 
And then the priest will give him or her the Holy Eucharist. And then we now have the anointing. The person will be anointed. So these are the three things we do. Confession, anointing, and then the Holy Eucharist. And this is meant to be food for the soul. That the Eucharist gives the person strength to go through whatever he or she is undergoing. The sacraments have a lot of benefits. And I just want to talk about five benefits. One, uniting of our sickness to the passion of Christ for our good and for the good of the church. Two, courage and strength to endure suffering. It is very consoling when you know that Christ is with you in your suffering, he has not abandoned you. Three, forgiveness of sins, if the person was not able to receive confession. And then for restoration of health, according to God's will. If there's a will of God, the person receives the sacrament and then he or she recovers. Then finally, the faith one, preparation for passing over to eternal life. That when you are on your sick bed and then you receive this sacrament, you have been assured by the church, the Lord is with you. So you are open and then you can die peacefully, knowing that your soul will go back to your creator. So it is a way to take care of all kind of emotional and psychological challenges that people may have. It, this does not mean that it is devoid of spiritual power, divine power. The divine power cannot be overemphasized. And when we go to the scriptures, we will realize that listening to Doc Juan, Juana and then Prof, uh, they made good points and we have seen that mental health, our way of life can also trigger some mental sickness. And if you look at scripture, second, uh, first Samuel, the book of first Samuel 16, 14 to 19, when Saul was deposed as king of Israel, because he was, he could not wait for Samuel to come and offer the sacrifice. And on two occasions, he disobeyed God, and God said, I've taken my spirit from you. The kingship is taken from you to be given to David. That Saul went mad, that an evil spirit descended on him. And then they asked that David should come and play the lad for him to soothe his spirit. So what made him go mad, have mental problems? Because he lost his position. He lost the favor of God. He did something wrong. And what makes many people commit suicide today is because they, they cannot reconcile with certain things. They cannot forgive themselves. And when you go back to scripture, you see the case of Judas. Judas betrayed Jesus. Peter betrayed Jesus. He said he didn't know him three times. All the other disciples ran away. But why did Judas commit suicide and Peter didn't? Peter was able to handle his mental challenges. He accepted the situation, confessed, but Judas could not accept the situation. So he went and committed suicide. And these are issues of mental cases. Not that he was already going through mental cases, but the situation made, him too, made it too difficult for him to accept. So the point I'm making here is that our lifestyle, certain conditions can trigger mental cases. And if they are sinful acts, then we need God's forgiveness. We need God's pardon. And if we do not take care of that, then it develops. And you are sent to the hospital and you can never be cured. That is where you need healing. You need to be exorcised. So uh, I'm not undermining the medical or the finding other authentic ways, modern ways. Yes, I accept those ways, but I'm making the, 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 the fact that if these things are not triggered biologically or it has nothing to do with our, our chromosomes or whatever it is within us and it's not hereditary, there are external causes, our way of life can trigger it. And when it's a sinful act which is triggering it, you need spiritual intervention. So the practice of exorcism is the next 
exorcism in the Catholic Church. So the practice of exorcism is recorded in the writings of the early fathers, including Justin Martyrs, as far as 165 AD. So many, many years ago, if you read the records, these men and women of God believe in exorcising people, the influence, evil forces, demons, and the Bible talks about demons. So far as we have Satan, we believe that Satan exists, evil exists. We cannot deny demons or evil spirits. They are realities. So Tertullian, 213, Strail of Jerusalem, 386 AD. They all have written and mentioned the importance of exorcising people and places that are being under the influence of Satan and his demons. Jesus came to destroy the works of Satan. 1 John 3, 8. So he came to destroy the works of Satan. So exorcism is an old practice in the Catholic Church because the church recognizes the existence of Satan and his demons, as well as the harm they can cause on humans, objects, and places. Before exorcising somebody, the Catholic Church is very aware of the medical, the mental health of people, that not all mental cases are demonic oriented. So an exorcist in the Catholic Church, before he or she would, before he would go on to exorcise, first the person must be sent to the hospital for specialists to ascertain that the condition of the person has nothing to do with the medical causes, that it is not mental illness. When this is ascertained, then the exorcist starts his prayer. When he starts the prayer, then the, the demoniac, the one possessed, will begin to show some signs. And then that will let him know that, yes, this is a spiritual problem. So that is the, the, the stand of the Catholic Church, and that's the practice. So now I want us to look at some levels of demonic attacks. For those of you listening, and if you do not believe in demons, maybe what I'm about to say may scare you, or you may find it very um, funny, but that's a reality. So we have what we call demonic possession. So this occurs when Satan takes full possession of the body but not the soul. So we have to make a distinction between the body and the soul. So the soul cannot be touched. Your will can never be touched by anybody. Even if a thief puts a gun on you and says, show me where your money is, that gun cannot force you until deep within you, you say, yes, I will show it. He cannot uh, force that to be done. Though there is a uh, question from external, but you have to accept, okay, let me show. So, our soul can never be touched by the devil, but he can attack the body. So when we are saying you are possessed by a demon, the demon lives in the person, acts, makes the person to act in ways, but the person cannot be blamed because the person is not willing, willingly doing it. It is out of his or her will. So, and when we go to the scriptures, Prof made mention of that, the demoniac of Garasai, who was bound with chains and he would break the chains and all that. So you can see such a power in such a person. But Jesus was able to cast out the, the demons and then he was fine. So that's one demonic possession. Second, external physical pain caused by Satan. Satan can also cause some pains in us. So we know this from the lives of some of the saints. Saint Paul, uh, Prof made mention. St. Paul said there was a thorn in his flesh. He prayed three times to God, but God said, my grace is sufficient for you. What exactly that thing was, uh, we don't know. Then the ass, the, 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 the query of ass, then Padre Pio, one of the modern saints. All these people suffered beatings. They were flogged, they were beaten, they were pummeled by demons. So these external forms of persecution 
do not affect the soul and therefore there is no need for exorcism. So if it's just a physical attack, you, you, you don't need to be exorcised. That's why Paul was never prayed for. He was never exorcised. Then the third attack we can get from Satan is what we call diabolical oppressions. Diabolical oppressions. And these are symptoms. These symptoms may vary from severe to mild. So here too, there is no possession. There is no loss of consciousness or involuntary action and word. So the Bible gives us some examples of people who suffered diabolical oppression. Job in the Bible, the story of Job. If you read at the beginning that God allowed Satan to go and torture Job, but he said, do, do not touch his soul, don't take his life. So a lot of misfortunes befell Job. He didn't know why, but he held on to God. So God allowed that that's what we call demonic oppressions. A lot of misfortunes and many things happening in your life. Then we can also, St. Paul also falls under this. And then the fourth type is what we call the diabolic obsession. Obsession, diabolic obsession. And that has to do with mental attacks, mental attacks. You begin to hear voices. You begin to hear a lot of things in your mind. And well, the, the specialists, the psychiatric would have their own explanations to that. But we also have some spiritual attacks which can lead to that. So now I go to other ways of opening up to demons. Sometimes I said uh, the mental cases we are going through, we, we are the causes. So what are some of the things we do that can lead us to have spiritual, mental, mental cases that are spiritually uh, based? One going I will to be happy if Father can do that in about a minute for us. Thank okay, you. thank you. So that would be going to see a psychic or a medium, trying to communicate with the dead, playing with other things like uh, old juja boss, reading of palms, consulting the occult. All these things can bring us, um, can open up to evil forces and powers. So exorcism in the church is important, and then we carried it out for people we know are really going through problems. So since um, 1583, in the year when we had the Synod of Rhymes, so the, the bishops said that no mental illness should be taken care of. And before the exorcist, we we'll go to do these things, we have to make sure that we have eliminated all things. So in the Catholic Church, we have two forms of exorcism, just by way of conclusion. The ordinary one, which is done at the time of baptism, you renounce Satan and all his powers. Then the solemn one, which is done by the specialist, the exorcist, and he has to be appointed by the bishop of the diocese. And he is given the permission to do this. So admittedly, it is difficult to distinguish between um, somebody who is mentally sick and you want to say is psychological or it is spiritual. But the exorcist, he is open to both mental causes and spiritual causes. And so he's able to read the, the signs. So we need collaboration between the medical experts and then the spiritual experts. So before any pastor or any exorcist, try to eliminate medical causes. Be sure that this person is not suffering from a mental sickness that can be treated medically before you proceed. That would be my advice. Thank you very much for the time given and the opportunity. Father, thank you so much for your presentation. We now Welcome. move into the Q&A time. But you agree with me that our speakers have done very well with the specific areas that were assigned to them. We are so grateful and we are also grateful to about 76 participants who are still with us on this special lecture. Let your questions keep coming through the chat. After we have engaged those ones on the chat, we will give room for audio once so that we respond to them accordingly. 
And so this particular session, I will encourage my dear speakers to unmute so that as I pose the question to you, you can help us address them. Dr. Joanna, can you help us with this? It sounds like the faith-based view of mental illness is everything except what that society defines as normal. The question is, is it far-fetched to say that such societies use such classifications as control measures? Okay, thank you very much. So um, I mentioned um, um, someone in distress as one of the um, measures we can know someone is suffering from mental illness. So if you believe that by using specific um, quote unquote rituals, including the faith, um, you can be calmed, then you use it, it works for people. Uh, it may not necessarily um, heal the person of the mental illness, but it may give some bit of relief temporarily as long as the person relies on that faith. It, it, it sort of um, serves as a, a measure to calm that person as long as he relies on, on that faith. So yes, um, they may use that as some level of gratification. Apostle, please, can you help us on this? Traditional healing is cheaper and accessible since there is lack of psychiatry service in low income nations. Could it be that because of its affordability and accessibility, that is why most people resort to it as the therapeutic measure in dealing with mental health? Yeah, thank you very much. That can be one of the reasons why people move there because it is less um, expensive so far as money is concerned. But I think that the larger part comes from our worldview because we believe that the thing is spiritual. There is someone behind what is happening. We want to find out what specifically is happening. So the, the tendency to know the one in, in literal language is the cause or who is doing you, who is the cause of the illness or the challenge actually causes people to visit these places, even more than uh, uh, economic uh, parties. Because sometimes you have some people who are very rich, well endowed, yet they will be towing, they will be going to such places. Um, thank you. Thank you. Reverend, so I, I just have... want to, to add something quickly to what Prof said. Um, me, um, psychiatric treatment is supposed to be free, especially when you are seeking it from um, the public um, oh. facility. Um, the, for the accessibility, because of the same stigma we are talking about, um, currently there are psycho psychiatric units in major general hospitals or district hospitals across the country. And so accessibility shouldn't be difficult. If you don't want to go to the mainstream psychiatric unit, you can have access to um, the, the units at the various um, general hospitals. Thank you very much. Good, you're welcome. Father Chris, please, can you help us on this? Please, is there an overwhelming evidence that faith-based treatment of mental illness work? Father Chris. Yes, thank you. Okay. Yes, thank you. Hope you can hear me. Yes, please. Okay. Yes, there are evidence that it works right from scripture. I've quoted some passages from scripture where Jesus healed, where other men of God healed people who had mental cases. And in the church today, we still have a lot of evidence within the Catholic Church that I can speak for sure. Because I have made it very clear <clears throat> that there are two causes of mental illness. What triggers it? Either it is biological, it is hereditary, whatever, something is wrong somewhere, but your action, your sinful way of life can also let you invite evil forces into you, speaking to the dead, 
consulting witchcraft, reading magic and all that, this can, can lead you to mental problems. And since they are spiritual based, if you are sick, mentally sick, you need spiritual healing. And the, the faith, the church can heal you of that. So there are a lot of evidence to that. Thank you very much. All right, Reverend, can I also come uh, into this? Yes, question? please. Yes. Pro, yes, please. Right, okay. th yeah, thank you very much. Yes, there are evidences that uh, some people can actually be cured of mental illness from divine healing uh, perspective. Uh, I myself, for instance, one time I was invited by a co-apostle to come and um, um, hold seminar for his church leaders. But when I went there, I was very tired, so I did not attend that afternoon session and decided to take some rest and visit them in the evening. But then, when as I was resting, the pastor in charge, the local pastor, the pastor who was hosting, brought one of the church officers who had been mentally disturbed, shouting, and as you say, that mental problem. So that he was sending the lady to hospital, but he would like his regional apostle at the time to pray for her. The apostle was not there, so I was asked to come and pray for her at that time. Genuinely, I didn't feel like praying at all. I prayed because if I had failed to pray, they wouldn't understand that. Why is it that our apostle is not here, but this man, they call him apostle, but wouldn't come and pray for her. But as I was praying, she said that it is living, it is living, it is living. And that's all. Immediately after that, the pastor, uh, together with two men who had held the woman in his vehicle, sending them to the hospital. So they were going when the woman spoke that, pastor, what is happening? And they said, well, you are not well, so we are sending you to the hospital. She said, no, I'm okay. And up till today, what I'm saying is in the 90s, up to today, she had never experienced that thing again. But I believe that if you pray for somebody and the person is not healed or, uh, uh, or cured, you should not chain the person or force the person to fast. It means the issue is not spiritual. You should send the person to the hospital. This is my belief. Thank you very much. Thank you. Then, Prof, please, can you continue with this question as a follow-up on that ground? Someone wants to know, if healing is indeed the sovereign act of God, why is it that when someone has a weak faith, it affects the person being healed? Or should it be the case that someone who has not been healed after a spiritual exercise means that the person has little faith? Yeah, I, I believe that healing is the sovereign act of God and God comes in to heal whenever he has. Whether the person has got little faith, uh, or sometimes even no faith, uh, or great faith. When the person has a great faith, uh, I think it shows that uh, the person has exercised his or her faith in the sovereign God and encourages other people to have faith in God and bring in their problems. But if you take that of Jesus' healing into consideration, you see, when Jesus went to Bethsaida, he met this man who had been there for 38 years. And Jesus, do you want to get healed? The man started complaining. You know, he didn't say, he was not exercising faith in Jesus at all, but Jesus commanded the man to be healed. And you see the sovereign act of healing here. So I believe we have to do our part by exercising faith in God. But even after you have done everything, it is still the sovereign art of God that will bring you to him. Thank you, Prof. <clears throat> Dr. Joanna, please, how does our perceptions relating with other also put us in other perceptions? Can we all be seen by other man? The, the question, I've read the question in the inbox, but I, okay. I don't get it very well. I don't get, so if you can clarify that question for us, I will be very happy. So please kindly clarify it so that doctor responds to it accordingly for us. Father Chris, please kindly help us this. How will you advise the pastors and priests who receive people with mental illness? These people and their families believe that it is a spiritual problem. So if you tell them straight, a way to seek medical help, they will go to someone else who will feed into their belief. 
So what can the pastors do? Thank you very much. So as a, a pastor, I will use myself as an example. When I have such cases, I sit with a person. If the person comes in the right mood and can talk, I interview the person, get to know how it all started and what is his thinking about it. And I can also speak to a family member. But when you detect that it is something uh, medical that they need to get a psychiatric or a psychologist or a clinical psychologist, somebody to help, um, you can pray for the person. It wouldn't spoil anything, but not to exercise. There are differences. So you can pray for the person, but encourage him or her to go to the hospital. You have to convince him because you are a man of God talking to him or her. So if you say that, yes, I've listened, I've prayed, but I feel that the spirit, what the signs you have given me, you can be helped in the hospital. And we must also make it clear to them that God has various ways of healing. And the hospital is one way of healing. He heals us through our doctors and nurses. So it is not only to the church, our pastors, that we can receive healing. So with that, I think um, they may listen to you and go. If you do this and they, they, they refuse and go elsewhere, what else can you do? You can follow them around. Thank you. Thank you. Apostle Prof, can you tell us how the church to train its leaders on the abuse of people in the name of the exorcism? Some do it unaware or fake, but how do we then do it as the church community? Uh, thank you very much. One of the things that I still, I think that is still lack in, um, um, in our theological seminaries, it's a lack now, it's our teaching on witchcraft and demonology. Uh, we pick some of the demonology aspect from the West, but our concept is, is witchcraft. Witchcraft is still very, very prominent here. So I think theological institutions need to uh, allow people to be trained, uh, our lecturers to be trained in witchcraft and demonology aspects so that they will be able to educate our people, teach them to be able to handle demonic issues. We have started something within Pentecost University, which I call witch demonology. The aspect that I think is very relevant to African practical situations. So I think we need such uh, courses to be properly taught in our institutions. Thank you. Thank you. Please, Thank I guess you. we should add, add, add up to Prof. Prof, um, perhaps we should also be thinking about uh, probably basic um, psychological issues, talking about basic psychological issues too in a seminary as well. Thank you. Yes. Good. And to, and to add to that, if you come to the Ramsia Training Center of the Presbyterian Church of Ghana, where I serve as the chaplain, as Prof indicated, we also have package of search programs that we take church leaders through. We run seminars training for church leaders in this field of discipline for the church. And so on this note, I will encourage all those who need such orientation to uh, patronize with the Ramsey Training Center's package to be able to equip their members. We have some time if there is any question, clarification, or comment, you can unmute, briefly introduce yourself, and <coughs> straight to your question. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Yes, Hi. I'm a free, a free Father Kum. Good afternoon to you all. Good afternoon, Father. Can you hear me? Yes, we can please. hear you, can Bishop. Hear. We can hear you. <laughs> okay. I just want to, I saw uh, some pictures when Prof. Uh, Onyina uh, was talking. He showed some slides uh, where people have been chained uh, at some prayer camps and so forth. Uh, the question that i like to ask, maybe they can help us, is uh, what can we also do when people are, as it were, abused in this way? Can we report? to uh, police or so uh, or something so that they could all come in and uh, as it were in these people from this is I think it is a very dehumanizing and uh, experience 
And in some cases, or in most cases, it's not the place to be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Hello. you. Hello. Hello. So. Hello, Mark, uh, Maxwell. Yes, please. Yes. Um, the first speaker indicated that um, psychiatric drugs are free in Ghana. And uh, I just want to draw her attention that I am uh, a development practitioner at the grassroots level. And uh, we need to commend government for training many psychiatric or mental health officers. And today we have them at the district hospitals, even at the sub-district hospitals. But the truth of the matter is that when government says that a particular drug is free, that drug becomes very scarce. And so many a times, the people will get to the hospital or the psychiatric units and the drugs are not there. They are in, they are, they are in serious uh, uh, shortage. And so this is the challenge that we have. And so I will want to say that, how can we advocate to ensure that government ensures that these drugs are in constant supply on a sustainable basis so that people can access these services? Then uh, my other concern that I have uh, which I have uh, indicated to Professor Zuma, and I want this platform to help me. Currently, there is a, I sent that question and I was expecting to hear that uh, there's a girl of about 12 to 14 years old who has been beaten and traumatized and taken to the Gambagas, uh, which is come. This little girl has lost the mother and she was staying with the, uh, the mother's brother. Now she has been accused as a witch. She's currently in the which has come there as key stakeholders on this platform. What can we do? What advice can you give me so that we'll see how we can uh, rescue this girl? Thank you. Thanks so much. Yes. Professor Zuma. Yes. Well, uh, thank you, Maxwell, for your question. And I think uh, Bishop's question too was answered by uh, lawyer Angela Jamena. Uh, that such cases should be reported. Such abuses, we shouldn't see them happen in churches and just turn the other way around. If it pricks your conscience that it's not right, please say something to somebody about it. Uh, because until we begin to do that, this will not stop. With regards to the young lady uh, that has been accused of witchcraft, uh, I have discussed with Maxwell and uh, we are definitely putting our heads together to see what we can do. Uh, next month, I have to say, next month's lecture is on the witchcraft accusations and on the witch camps. We've got three very qualified speakers. One is an, a, a, a United Nations representative on human rights in the country here. Uh, another is a, a former minister of state who attempted to close the witch camps uh, and the challenges that she faced, she'll be here to share with us. And another is an NGO worker who is working in the witch, with the, with the so-called witch camps. So next month, lecture is going to be on witchcraft again. And we invite you all to, to come and listen. But for this immediate problem, I think we have to talk to social welfare people on the ground uh, and report it to Dovsu, uh, and all the other uh, agencies on the ground in the north for them to intervene immediately and get this little girl out of the camp. Can I, can I ask uh, a follow-up question to the first part of uh, uh, Bishop's uh, um, submit question about a free mental health uh, uh, provision in Ghana? I have a family member who is now currently very, very sick and uh, we, we are trying to assess one of the uh, hospitals in uh, Ghana. And they are telling us to bring a very large sum of money uh, uh, and then uh, telling us there is no bed. Uh, about three times right now, we try to assess that. They are saying there is no bed. And so, um, so these are uh, just uh, one example. So. Uh, how practical is it that um, uh, we can assess mental health services in government hospitals? I, I mentioned that it is supposed to be free, but um, 
Reverend has made us aware that um, working there, uh, we get shortages. So like he mentioned, then the advocacy should um, come in. Yeah. Because today, like I keep saying, today it is someone else. Tomorrow it may be me. So I think that um, the uh, budget for mental health is highly inadequate. So I don't know whether that accounts account for that. But um, to um, the one who just spoke, could we change the facility as well and see whether the cost probably can come down? Please, any other? Yes, I, I, Maxwell, I have another question. Uh, and that question goes to uh, Dr. Juan. And uh, in her submission, I was critically looking at uh, the bisocial uh, model. And uh, 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 no, yes, the bisocial model. Psychosocial model. model. Yeah, yeah, the bisocial model. Psychosocial. Yes, yes model. And uh, I want to find out from you, uh, what would be your advice if somebody wants to marry from a particular family that has, that has mental health related issues? What would be your advice? Because mental health, okay. to some extent, is hereditary. So what would be your advice? Sure. Thank you. Okay, so I, I will bear in mind the fact that there are treatment or management models available. Yes. And so um, married, marriage basically is a decision individuals make. And yes. so I would advise that you seek insight into that particular condition. Yes. And then you to make that decision because there are treatment options, there are management options available. And yes. so once you probably understand the nature of the condition and then the available interventions, you can um, make your decision based on, on that. Okay. Thank you, oh. Reverend. Okay, thank you. I, I, I'm not Reverend, I'm just Maxwell. Maxwell, I can't Yes. Clearly. Clearly. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, one, one more question and we go. The question from Sarah, he says, so many of the instances we are looking at also involve trauma and trauma responses. Are any speakers or participants aware of current research engaging? Engaging with Ghanaian to, approaches to the, to the therapeutically therapy. engaging the lasting impacts of trauma. Can I take it again so that Apostle may help us? So many of the instances we are looking at also involve trauma and trauma responses. Are any speakers or participants aware of current research engaging with Ghanaian approaches to therapeutically engaging the lasting impacts of trauma? Um, yeah, there are a few of them which I will need to go back to. Uh, records and see if we can recommend some for them. Yes. I mentioned that at the psychology department too, we can um, look out for um, people who are engaged in trauma research for um, the, the one who question, asked the question. Yeah, let me know when you find something and I can forward it to her. Yes. She's doing some research. Thank you. Yes. Okay, okay. Hello, can I? It's Father. Yeah. Yes, Father, also coming, Father, coming from the yes, the spiritual point of view, um, we have what we call inner healing. So if the person belongs to a church that the pastors are well trained for inner healing, because uh, the, in every tra uh, traumatic situation, there is a need for forgiveness. The one who has traumatized you, you need to forgive the person. And when that hatred, that anger you have for the person is taken out of you, then you can be free. If not, it affects your mental health yourself. So if the pastors are well trained, uh, they can also get some help in, from the church, specialists who can take them through inner healing and counseling. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Towards uh, conclusion and final submission from the uh, director of the Institute as the chair for this afternoon lecture. All that I want to bring our attention to is appreciate the speakers for the world research presentation and also our dear participants for your time and your contributions. 
this afternoon has been a lecture on mental health. To say any discourse on mental health is a discourse about us. So this afternoon we met to talk about us. We engage our own life and the life of our very own. Dr. Joanna did indicate that we are in terms of mental fitness, we are temporarily fit now because the next second there can be a trigger which will call for a mental health attention. And therefore this afternoon lecture has been a talk to us about us for us and how we can have a proper orientation to mental health discourse so that we can help ourselves and to help people who are around us. This knowledge, let us keep sharing, let us keep engaging, let us keep rescuing. As Prof. Onyina indicated, Jesus brought the man back home. Let us go on a search to bring our people back home. Let us go to the prayer camps. Those who have been ignorantly changed, let us go and bring them back home. Those who have been falsely accused, let us go and bring them back home. Jesus Christ states indicate that my peace I leave you, not as the world gives. It means mental fitness, soundness, to be peaceful with yourself, with others, and God is key. Let us yearn. Let us work. Let us fight against any system that will want to stand against the soundness of our other neighbors. You are an agent of someone's mental fitness. Let us go there as true healers for this sickling world. Thank you, and God bless you. Prof. Azuma, I hand it Thank over you. to you. Thank you so much. I, I call her Madam Moderator. She keeps referring to herself as chairperson because she's afraid the Presbyterian Church will suck her. So there's only one moderator. <laughs> if it's the chairperson, you cry silence <laughs> under two. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Osofo. <laughs> I thank you the, to the speakers, as Osofo said. Please, participants, uh, this is one of the very highly participated topics. We have a sequel, if you like, uh, on this topic, which is the witchcraft dimension. And we are going to look at that uh, next month. Look out for the for the for the for the for the for the, for the, for the flyer and please register for it. We are so grateful to have Professor Andrew Walls again uh, with us and to have some of our board members here, uh, Bishop Baul and Bishop uh, Afrifa, uh, Dr. I Professor Emmanuel Bellon. Thank you all for showing up and uh, enjoy the rest of your day and the week and keep us in your prayers as we try to educate and share knowledge with African society on some of these important topics. God bless you all and keep safe and keep well. Bye-bye.